We're on it. All right. Welcome to the 2015-2016 Google Hangout Seminar Series. Today, Greg Lyons will be telling us about the physics of pyrotechnic whispers. Greg is a PhD candidate in engineering science at the University of Mississippi, where he previously received a, a Master's of Science in 2012. He graduated in 2010 with a Bachelor of Science in Physics and Mathematics from Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas. His doctoral research at the National Center for Physical Acoustics is in the statistical scaling of the intrinsic wind noise in the atmospheric boundary layer. As a member of the NCPA Aeroacoustics Group, he has also contributed to experimental research and passive methods for supersonic jet noise reduction. Take it away, Greg. Okay, thanks. Well, good to be here. Uh, Y'all can hear me fine? So that's great. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen with you. There we go. Okay. All right. I assume everyone can see my presentation. Oh, yeah, we can see you All right, here we go. So. As was said, physics of pyrotechnic whistles is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but first, a little background. I kind of wanted to just talk about briefly what noise is before we get into the whistle. Um, you know, there's three definitions that I can come up with um, for noise. The first is noise is sound. Um, that's maybe not the best definition. Um, uh, there's some more specific definitions we could use. Another definition that's very common in the acoustics community is that of unwanted sound. Uh, so this would include problems of uh, community noise, occupational noise, that sort of thing. Uh, noise in your environment that you would rather not be there uh, for health or uh, other reasons. But probably the most common definition that goes outside of just acoustics where I work is uh, not signal. And what that means is that it encompasses anything that you would rather not measure. Um, and so the consequence of this is that one person's noise can be another person's signal. Uh, that one person is interested in measuring one thing uh, that's just a nuisance to someone else. So whenever your definition though, all noise is going to be caused by something. And we can use physics to describe and model noise just as well as we can anything else. Um, you know, it's, it's a point of some disappointment for me that when you use the word noise, a lot of people immediately think that we're dealing with some sort of, uh, you know, stochastic uh, process, background process, something that's just there that we have to contend with. Uh, but there's physics to this. So why am I spending this time talking about noise? Uh, that's because that's what my research is primarily. Um, that I've done some work in wind noise, and this is uh, you go outside to make an acoustic measurement, you bring your microphone, and you discover that you're swamped by something that's definitely not acoustics. And this is the pressure that's generated by turbulence in the wind. And so a lot of my work uh, has been trying to understand statistical structure of that noise and related to the meteorology. I've also done a lot of work, as was mentioned before, uh, in jet noise, principally experimentally. I've chosen two pictures here that I like a lot. The first on the left is a, this is a Boeing 7047 it's on approach. Uh, and you can imagine the people who live in that community there are not exactly thrilled to be in that flight path. Um, on the right, you have a Super Hornet. It's being launched from aircraft carrier. And you can see there's a lot of folks surrounding that. Um, as it takes off, and they have to contend with being in a very high noise environment. Um, and that's something that, oh, whoops. Okay, sorry. That's something that, uh, that you know, we, we would like to help them out with in reducing noise. So that's, that's another problem, and you can relate that to the physics of the turbulent flow. Uh, but enough talk about that. You came to hear about fireworks. So, uh, Here's an example. Let's see if this works. Okay. This is a pyrotechnic whistle. Okay. 
Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear that. I'm going to do this one more time. And when I do, I want everyone to maybe try to make some observations about what you're seeing and hearing from this whistle that might help give you a handle on what's actually causing the sound. Okay. So there's our example. Before I go any further, especially because this is going on on the internet, uh, an important message. Please use caution with all pyrotechnics. This is dangerous. Do not build your own if you have not been trained. Um, this, this, especially whistles, do not. Do not attempt to modify commercially available fireworks. That's a one-way ticket to some very bad things. <laughs> And especially exercise care with whistle mix. Um, it burns very rapidly, and it will explode if it's not properly handled. Uh, whistle mix is a very special mixture. Um, so generally, don't mess with fireworks if you don't have the training and background to do it, OK? So having said that, what is a pyrotechnic whistle? Well, this is a common sound effect that's used in many fireworks. Um, they're, they're very common. And what you need to have a pyrotechnic whistle is actually fairly simple. You need a tube. Any tube will do. Usually people use cardboard, some sort of cardboard tube. Um, you also need a particular pyrotechnic composition. This is a mixture of fuel and oxidizer. And this is known as whistle mix. Um, there's a couple of recipes for that. We'll come back to that. And then you just need to light the thing. Uh, very simple. Now, this is a quote from a paper uh, in literature, Podolsack and Wilson. Uh, and basically what they're saying here is that if you burn the stuff in an open atmosphere, just sitting on a table, say, it's going to burn very quickly, but it doesn't make any sound. Um, but as soon as you press it into this tube that you have, it makes the whistling sound. It burns in an oscillatory manner. Now, we often combine, well, People often combine these with uh, nozzle termination and other effects and turn them into a whistling rocket. And this is probably where you've encountered these before. This is a, a whistling chaser is a common example of these. People refer to these often as bottle rockets. Uh, but they're also useful in military applications for signaling and training. It's a great way to have a small thing that generates a lot of sound. Uh, so let's look at a smaller example. So I picked a bunch of these up. These are uh, Whistling chasers with report. Uh, I picked these up for a new year. And uh, what you can see the, on the bottom here is uh, Nick, when you take the wrapper off, it's, it's pretty unimpressive. You just have a fuse on the one end, and you've got some sort of cardboard looking tube. Uh, but what I discovered pretty quickly is that you can just cut these in half. And what you end up with when you do that is a whistle on the one end, okay, and a report on the other. And we don't really care about the report. The report's probably some combination of something like black powder. Uh, it's just meant to blow up. Uh, but what we really want to know about is this whistle. And it, by itself, the whistle does not explode. So I tried dissecting one of these for you all, and I discovered that that's very hard. Uh, I pretty much destroyed it in the process. So we're going to use a diagram instead. So let's, let's uh, blow this up here. So this is, again, this is schematic of what a whistle would be. It's got a fuse in the one end, and we have some sort of tube. And imagine we take a cross-section of this. OK. Now, what we have is a fuse at the one end. At the other end, we're going to have a solid pellet or a grain. And this is going to be the whistle mix. And it's been pressed into there at very high pressure. So it's essentially, it's a solid. It's not like a loose black powder rolling around in there. In between the two things, you just have empty space. That's it. And this is going to have some length. We're going to call that L. It'll be important later. Uh, and we can neglect the fuse to first order. <laughs> so th there's a conspicuous lack of anything that looks like a whistle. Um, you might expect it to be a little more complicated. I certainly did. Uh, for the examples that I'm using, the ones that I picked up, uh, the Initial tube length, you can use a dial calipers and stick the probe in there and get about 2.7 centimeters. So 
doesn't look like a whistle. We do have a pipe that's open at one end and it looks like it's closed at the other. So this kind of reminds us maybe of, uh, you know, standing waves in tube, sophomore physics, right? You've got some sort of organ pipe situation going on. So let's do a quick review of pipe modes for those of us who may have forgot. Uh, a standing wave, what is a standing wave? Standing wave is what happens when you have resonance in a pipe, and it's basically, it's a superposition of two waves that are traveling in opposite directions. And this occurs in many one-dimensional systems of resonance. A guitar string is another great example of that. Um, now, for any system that's going to resonate, the solutions that are admissible depend on the boundary conditions. And so for a tube, in, in the case of acoustics, there's two limiting conditions. And the first is the pressure release condition. And this is going to be like the open end of the tube. And in this case, the pressure oscillations in the acoustic wave are going to have a node. And conversely, the particle velocity, which is the actual velocity oscillations that are induced by the acoustic wave, are going to have an anti-node. So that's the open end, that's the pressure release. The exact opposite case of this is the rigid surface. And this is the, um, uh, the anti-node uh, for the um, pressure now. And the velocity is going to now be at a node. The velocity, the particles cannot move through the wall. Um, so this would be, again, this is like the closed end. So now let's, let's do a little comparison. Now what we think we have, based on the diagram, sure looks like an open closed tube, but just for grins, let's compare this with the open open resonance. And this is, these are figures you could look up in your, in your uh, sophomore physics textbook. For both cases, we're going to have a fundamental that's the lowest possible frequency that can resonate. And for the open closed resonance, that's going to be a quarter wave. So the frequency is going to be the sound speed divided by four times the length of the tube. On the other hand, for the open open case, you have the uh, you have twice that. You have a frequency that is the speed of sound divided by twice um, the length of the tube. That's your fundamental. And now each of these cases are going to have harmonics. These are the next highest frequencies on up that will resonate. Um, and so you can plot these out, first and second harmonic, and so on. The thing to notice is that the modal ratio for the open-closed resonance case is always going to be an odd number. So if I take my fundamental frequency and I divide it by any other higher harmonic, I'm always going to have an odd number. On the other hand, in the open-open case, both ends open, I have an integer ratio. The fundamental divided by the next mode up is always going to be an a integer. So, you know, if we somehow couldn't see what kind of tube was resonating, but we knew how long, well, and we could make a measurement of the fundamental and harmonics, this would allow us to tell, in theory at least, <laughs> if we knew certain things. Uh, whether we had a tube with a closed end or an open end. Um, this will actually be important in a minute. Uh, but before I go into actually looking at the measurement that I made, let's take a, a brief walk through history of whistles. Um, these, these were known to have been used by the 19th century. They probably used earlier. And originally, whistles were made with picarates. This is uh, picaric acid and its salts. These have the problem of being very highly explosive. Uh, they're extremely dangerous to work with. In fact, you can go on YouTube and just search for picric acid, and the first result that I pulled up was a news story of a bomb squad needing to be called in to dispose of picric acid in a storeroom at a college because it had been allowed to dry out. If it's not stored wet, even just twisting the lid off from the container can cause it to explode. It's awful stuff. So fortunately, we figured out a way to make whistles without that. Uh, but for a long time, they, they definitely are very dangerous to work with. And, and modern mixtures include uh, benzoates, salicyclate, uh, salicylates. So I'm not a chemist. <laughs> and, and you combine them with some sort of oxidizer. Usually, that's going to be a perchlorate. These are safer to handle. And um, interestingly, to me, 
at least, all of the uh, fuels are going to be salts of aromatic acids. And that, that that's the limit of my knowledge of chemistry. Uh, they contain a benzene ring. That would definitely be something very interesting to a chemist, I'm sure. Uh, the first study in literature, this is done by Maxwell, and um, his work was very interesting. He actually was tasked during World War II as using these it's a countermeasure for torpedoes against the Germans. Um, and it turns out that you can light one of these underwater and they'll work just fine. You don't need to have air for them to work. That's an interesting point. Um, and he established many of the basic properties. And then later on, work by Podolsack and Wilson that I quoted before, they actually took a closer look at the chemistry of the combustion reaction. So that's really my starting point in looking at this. So let's take a look at the experiment. So I took uh, several of these these whistles actually and I just made a, a, a crude measurement actually. This is a uh, B&K 4398 pressure microphone. Got that fed into an amplifier and I positioned that laterally one meter from the pyrotechnic whistle. So you see the microphone on the left here. And it's on the very end of this pipe. Try to get it out into the free field as much as possible. And of course, on the right here, you can see one of the whistles. It's clamped into my advanced ring stand. Uh, and so the news were sampled and digitized at 25 kilohertz. And so we took a couple of trials of these. And uh, you'll notice that where I'm making this measurement has a concrete floor. Normally, if you were trying to make an acoustic measurement of something, especially if you wanted to characterize the sound pressure level accurately, you would do this in what's known as an anechoic chamber, which is a, a room that has walls with wedges lined with foam in a particular way that you don't get any reverberation from the room. Unfortunately, I discovered the first time I lit one of these that they send off enough flaming shrapnel that uh, not a good idea to do that in a facility that someone else might want to use in the future. So we we went with a more reverberant environment that does have some consequences on the data, but fortunately nothing too severe. So this is an example of a time series of the pressure that I measured in that experiment. And you can see a couple of features here. First, we've got the whistle. This is the actual segment, segment where it's whistling, it's just like you heard in the video. There's some high pitched sound. And then at some point it stops and immediately after is followed by reports. That's, I didn't, remove the reports for these uh, tests. So that's where it actually explodes. And I took actually three trials of these, and you can see that it's not repeatable. Um, that obviously the manufacturing tolerances for uh, pyrotechnic whistles are not really too interested in repeatability. Um, <laughs> but you can see it still has all of the same characteristics, but this first trial really was the most well behaved, so that's what I used. Um, moving forward. Now one of the things that you can do with a time series like this is what's known as a spectrogram. Um, and this is basically, if you haven't had Fourier analysis, this is basically just you taking this signal here, you're breaking it up into a bunch of small segments, okay? And then you're looking at the distribution of tones that are in that signal, all the different frequencies that make up the signal in that short period of time. And you do that in blocks, and that's how you get the time axis here. And then you have your frequency axis on the y-axis. And the intensity is actually, well, it's related to the sound pressure level. It's the uh, power spectral density. That's on log axis. And so there's a couple of things to notice here. Again, we have the whistling period. That's where it's actually making the whistling sound. And there's where it reports, blows up. <clears throat> But you can see these three dark lines on the spectrogram. And what's very interesting about these is that these are peak frequencies that are actually decreasing with time. And you might have noticed that when you listen to the video, that as that whistle burns, the frequency decreases. And the reason for this is actually quite simple, that as the whistle burns, it burns up some of that pellet, that whistle mix to the bottom of the tube, and the length of the tube increases. So if the length increases, uh, what was that? Great. Sorry. Thought, yes. You're cutting out for a little bit. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you fine now. 
Okay, great. Uh, do you want me to pick back? Where do you just want me to keep going, or uh, uh, whatever you want? Okay. Well, let me just. I'll just in case you missed it. This the dark lines are what I'm pointing out here on the spectrum. And um, they're dropping in frequency with time. And that's important. Um, and what's happening is, is the tube's getting longer as you burn down that fuel mix. And so we'll come back to that in a second. That's it. Hmm. Um, is that, can you still, um, uh, did you say something? Yeah, it cut out right when we started again. And I'm not hmm. sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know what to do. I'll just keep. Uh, I'll keep going. <laughs> just tell me if it happens again. Um, okay. So uh, anyway, what we can do is plot lines on top of these these peaks here, and tentatively, I'm going to call this one at the lowest frequency the fundamental. Okay, related to what we saw with the pipe modes, we got the first harmonic, and then we've got some sort of yeah, you know, we got a second harmonic up there. So we take a closer look at these lines that we've extracted from the spectrogram. Um, what we can do is take the first harmonic, divide it by two, second harmonic, divide by three, and these lines collapse right on top of each other. And so what this tells us is this is like the modal ratio. Remember, the modal ratio for the open, open ended tube is going to be integers. And so this is like the open, open tube solution. So this is a little strange. Let's take a closer look at that then. So if we take our initial frequency, the frequency that it just starts whistling at, and we use that length that I measured for the tube, we can use that information and can plug it into the equation here for the open, open resonant frequency and solve for the sound speed. And what you get is a sound speed of about 220 meters a second. And that seems a little odd. You know, the speed of sound in air, in dry air, at room temperature is about 345 meters a second. So, okay, we originally thought this was an open-closed situation before we saw this ratio, this modal ratio. So let's try that case and see what we get for the speed of sound. Plug in the same numbers, and that gives us 450 meters a second. Um, so that's a little strange too. They both seem to be outside of the range of speed of sound and air, but we need to ask ourselves, what should we actually expect the speed of sound to be inside the tube? And this is very interesting. You know, like I said, that's the speed of sound in air at room temperature. The speed of sound is given by this equation. You got the square root C, the speed of sound is C, I should say. That's the square root of gamma, that's the specific heat ratio, um, times the universal gas constant over the molar mass, the molecular weight, I should say, uh, times the temperature. So for drier near room temperature, you have 1.4 and 29, respectively, for gamma and M. <coughs> what I've done is taken the stoichiometric products for the reaction um, for a common whistle mix. It might not actually be what's inside this whistle, but it's a common mix that's used. And you can take those products and assume they're an ideal gas and work out what the specific heat ratio and the molecular weight should be. And you get different numbers, 1.37 and 45.2. And this has a profound consequence for the speed of sound. If we had the gaseous products of the whistle reaction at room temperature, the speed of sound would actually be slower than it would be in air. Um, and the main reason for this is that our molecular weight is so much greater. And that's mostly due to having carbon dioxide as one of the products. But the problem with saying that the speed of sound at room temperature, uh, the problem with this is that the products have just gone through a very exothermic reaction. Uh, the gaseous products are not going to be anywhere near room temperature. And so what we can do is invert this equation and say, well, let's try the open-closed solution speed of sound and estimate what the temperature would have to be for that to occur. And what you get is about 520 degrees Celsius. This seems really... Yes. really what was that? Uh, speakers are cutting out again, so I was wondering why. 
Okay. I do not know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. <laughs> okay. I'll try to move around less. Maybe I'm throwing off the yeah. thing. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, we do have, we do have that storm moving through, so um, there's there's a possibility. Um, anyway, I'll keep going to the bitter end. So, so uh, anyway, all I was going to say is that 520 degrees Celsius. That's that's actually for for typical ignition temperatures for pyrotechnics. That's not an at atypical number. That's a good number that we would expect this mixture to burn at. Um, and so what we get out of this is then really the open closed solution, based on what we're seeing from the speed of sound, seems to be more likely. So, mm -hmm. you're good. Okay. Uh, so we need to take stock. What's going on here? We have the open closed resonance fundamental. We decided that based on the speed of sound that we ought to see. We have an open open to modal ratio. That is, we have the quarter way, or the, we should say the half wave resonator, the one, two, three modal ratio. And this doesn't make any sense. So we need to go back and re examine our assumptions in formulating this problem. And the question to ask, of course, is how is a pyrotechnic whistle different from an organ pipe? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, it exhausts gases. So that's all of the stuff you saw pouring out of the end of the example. And this is how you can, this is why, rather, you can use them in small rockets because they generate thrust. There's gases, the gaseous products expand after they're reacted. The length of the tube, as we said before, that increases over time because we're burning down that whistle mix pellet, okay? And most importantly, it's burning. That, that, that's actually the most important one. Organ pipes are usually not on fire. Uh, so more to the point, though, in the burning question is that we have a unique boundary condition that we shouldn't expect the surface where that whistle, mix whistle mix mixture is burning and turning into some sort of uh, some gaseous products, we shouldn't expect that to just behave like a rigid boundary, okay? So this is where some of my theoretical work comes in. I've tried my very best to spare the physics from the math for you. And so here's the approach. First, you want to construct, or that I want to construct, a simple one-dimensional model of a pyrotechnic whistle. Then find resonance solutions from that model and describe characteristics of the reactions that would emit those solutions. Solutions. Um, we're going to approach this as a linearized acoustics problem. And what does that mean? This is very important for acoustics. And what it, what it means is that we're going to assume all of the oscillating parameters in the governing equations. So this is the pressure, the density, the velocity, temperature. All of these things can be expressed as very small changes from some sort of base state that's not oscillating. Okay? And in doing so, we say, well, if we have two very small quantities, and we multiply them together, we're going to end up with something that's even smaller. And so in the governing equations, you neglect everything that's higher than first order in the fluctuations. And this is equivalent, if you're familiar, with a, a Taylor series expansion of first order. This is basically how you get to linearized acoustics. So the model properties, how we're going to try to model this whistle. So you can see this is my oversimplified whistle. Um, what was that? Is there a question? Sorry. <laughs> okay, we're good. Uh, this, this orange line here is my crude attempt at representing combustion. On the left-hand side here, you've got that whistle mix, that solid grain, it has some sort of pressure and density. And then as we move on down the tube, we've got some sort of gaseous product inside the tube. It's flowing out yeah. the tube at some fixed velocity, V naught. 
and it's got all of its state variables and velocity, okay? So I basically just set all of that. We'll assume at the far end we have a pressure release termination and make this easier on ourselves. It's going to be one-dimensional, and um, we, I'm going to neglect viscosity and conduction. So those are the basic assumptions for the model. Now, what are some effects that these changes, that these, these basic properties of the model have in changing the problem from the uh, standard organ pipe open-closed, open-open resonator solution? Well, the first is adding the exhaust. So we have that steady exhaust flow, that v naught that's exhausting out the end of the pipe. And there, this is going to have two effects on the standing wave. The first is going to be a destruction of the standing wave symmetry. So if we reiterate by illustration here, well, my animation is not going to play. That wave should move to the right. <laughs> we have a wave moving to the left. And if you combine these waves, like I was saying before, that's how you get a standing wave. You have some sort of interference, the left and right traveling waves, to give you that red line that's oscillating there. But now, if I have some sort of steady flow, what happens is it's almost like an inverse uh, Doppler effect, where I end up stretching out the wavelengths in the direction that the flow is going down the tube and shortening them in the direction against the flow. And so if I want to have a standing wave solution, what you end up with some, is something that doesn't quite look like it did before. Um, the oscillations in the standing wave are a little funny. Um, they don't all become equally zero at once. <clears throat> but you still have the important characteristics that you have nodes at both ends. This is, I should say, this is an open-open solution. Okay. Now, the other effect that this has is an introduction of another non-acoustic mode. And this can, be, this can be a little confusing. You can imagine that every time that the tube oscillates, every time that you have some sort of cycle in the tube, you generate a bunch of hot gases. You generate a bunch of heat and mass. And that could go into the acoustic wave, but it also could just get carried out the end of the tube. And that's what I'm calling an advection mode. This is not acoustic. It's this green line that you see there. And that's just going to be another traveling wave that moves on down the tube. And this can actually compete with the acoustic mode, the resonance that's acoustic in the tube. So these are the two effects that adding the exhaust has. Now, how about the burning surface? This is very interesting. There's a lot that I could say about this. But there's some important simplifications that you can make to model this. And what you do is, is you say it's a very narrow front at the surface, and it's burning down into that grain, that solid thing, at some fixed velocity. And you derive equations based on the idea that this is so small that you can just relate the changes as sudden jumps, instantaneous jumps, um, across the burning front. And when you do that, you find that the pressure has to balance with the momentum of the products that are exhausted out this way, okay? And you have to have an energy balance. The kinetic and internal energy has to balance with the heat that's released by the combustion. And these are two very important effects, but you also need to have now a model for the combustion. So well, this is where the chemical kinetics come into play. And First, we need to define what def deflagration is. This is subsonic burning. This is what's in occurring inside the tube with the pyrotechnics. And this is opposed to detonation. So when something explodes, that's supersonic burning. Okay? Deflagration is the opposite, subsonic, and it does not blow up. It just burns. And there are two processes that happen because of deflagration that have to be modeled in that combustion zone, that narrow area. Um, the first is the change in the rate of burning of the solid mixture. You can imagine that every time that, that acoustic wave comes down and compresses or refracts those gases, you might have some sort of change in the rate of, of the combustion. The second effect is an unsteady heat flux. So every time that the reaction, uh, if, it, if it increases, you're going to release more heat. 
um, if the reaction rate decreases, you're going to have less heat released. So you have some sort of oscillation in the heat that's coming in at the very end of the tube. And you can have contributions from this. You could also have secondary gas reactions. It can get quite complicated. Uh, one simplification that you can make is simply to say that this burning rate is really just going to depend on the pressure with some sort of exponent. And that's the equation you see here. Very simple. This is an equation that's used often in uh, solid rocket boosters. Um, it's a very common effect that they have to actually suppress in those cases. And the combustion heat flux, honestly, is very complicated. There's a lot to be said here. All of the different reactions are going to have respective molar heats of combustion. Each of them are going to release some heat into the flow, and you have to combine them all. And the gas phase in particular is complicated because it depends on the concentration. But basically, when you're thinking about the chemical kinetics and the change in the reaction at the end of the tube, just think about you have some sort of change in how fast it's eating up that solid uh, pellet of fuel, and you have some sort of change in how much heat is getting thrown out each cycle of the acoustic oscillation, if that makes sense. So you have this whole framework that you've built up, and, and there's a lot of equations I'm not showing that go into that. Um, but how do you solve this? <laughs> so the chemical kinetics, you use that in the jump boundary conditions that you saw before, and then you linearize everything, like I was saying. Every time you find two fluctuating quantities, they get multiplied together, you neglect them. Everything, you just keep everything to first order. And what you end up with is, is at least notionally very simple. You have four linear equations and four unknown coefficients. That's just linear algebra. And you can solve this and end up with this equation that you see here, um, that you have to have uh, the combination of the sine and cosine term uh, be zero. And D1 and D2 are going to be coefficients that are formed from all of our model parameters that have to do mostly with the chemistry. There are two possibilities for this to be true, because I have something that's imaginary and something that's real. Either we have the sine that's at a zero, the sine function is sitting at a zero, and d2 is zero, or the cosine evaluates to a zero, and d1 is zero, okay? The zero of either trig function is going to give us the mode shape. This is related to uh, the open-closed, the open-open geometry. And the coefficient condition is actually going to give us information about the chemical kinetics. So let's take a look at these two solutions. The first we'll look at is the half-wave resonator, because we saw in the experiment that we had some sort of modal ratio um, that looked like the uh, the open-open case. That's the half-wave resonator. And so you can see here, looking at our, our video, the pressure is at a node at both ends, so the pressure becomes zero both at the rigid end, which seems a little strange, right, and at the open end, which is what we expect. And then the velocity is anti-nodes at both ends. We also have this advecting mode that's just moving on down the tube as a traveling wave. And here is the resonant frequency. You can see that the frequency actually should drop if you increase the velocity. So that's an interesting effect. Now, solutions are only possible for this case if the solid, and I have a typo there, this should say deflagration, the solid phase deflagration doesn't participate. So if I don't have any change in the reaction um, at the grain, if I don't have any contribution from that burning surface in the solid phase, this all has to be oscillations due to some sort of gas phase combustion. And the advection mode in this case, and this is also important, this is an order of magnitude larger than the acoustic mode. And so that means that most of the energy for the half-wave solution is not going into the sound. And moreover, it has pretty stringent conditions on the chemistry. So that's the half-wave solution, but it is possible, and that's very, um, it's unexpected, at least to me. On the other hand, you have the quarter-wave resonator, and this is actually what you would expect from an open-closed tube. So you can see I've got the pressure is at an antinode at the surface, 
it's at a node at the end, and the opposite is true for the velocity. And again, I've got that other advecting mode just moving on down the tube. And the frequencies are similar to what we saw before, uh, but now, again, we have odd frequencies, odd modal ratio. Now, in this case, um, the pressure oscillation, because the pressure oscillates at the surface here, you can imagine it's contributing to this tangent state. So, you know, you have PV equals NRT, right? And every time that pressure state changes, you're going to change the state, the density and the temperature in some way at that surface. Um, if the parole, again, that's a typo. It's, I've evolved my understanding of the terminology. Um, if it doesn't participate at all, like we had in the first pace, we still, we actually end up with the acoustic mode and the advection modes are at the same order of magnitude. And as this increases, if we have more, a greater and greater pressure exponent, more and more contributions from the solid burning, okay, at that surface, the acoustic mode becomes more and more powerful. And you can also make some statements about the energetics. Um, there's a lot to be said here, but I can basically summarize this for you without uh, drawing out the point too much to say that if you look at those constants, the requirement that D1 and D2 be zero, you end up with constraints on how much heat has to be released by the reaction processes. And what you find out basically is that that half wave case that we already said is the acoustic energy, the amount of acoustic oscillation that's getting put out is not so great. For that solution to even exist, you have to have an order of magnitude more energy released by the combustion, okay? And in making all these comparisons, you know, what, what's going on? <laughs> um, We've made some assumptions, um, and, and we've found what we have is something that points to the quarter wave solution, so the open closed solution, with everything but that modal ratio. We look at that modal ratio and we say, gosh, that really looks like an open open tube, but everything else is telling us it's open closed. So we need to, again, go back and look at our assumptions, okay? And the first one we have we assumed linearity. Well, this might not be a great assumption. This has actually been stated by other people before. If you have a large enough pressure amplitude, neglecting those second order terms is not going to be a good approximation anymore. Okay? And a well known effect, this is known as nonlinearity. You're going to have nonlinear effects. And a well known effect of nonlinearity in acoustics is to generate harmonics from an initially sinusoidal wave, so that we could start out with the quarter wave fundamental and end up generating harmonics just by virtue of the fact that the pressure is so large. Um, and this is, this can be understood in terms of Fourier transform, where the wave actually gets distorted, and you actually end up pushing more energy out of the lowest fundamental into the higher frequencies, but that's not so important. Another effect that we might need to account for that's not may not be valid in the assumptions is that of chemical equilibrium through this whole thing i've assumed that the chemistry is in equilibrium well there are certain classes of chemical reactions where that's not true and in fact you can have chemical oscillations that oscillate this is a big problem uh, in something known as a continuous continuously stirred thermal reactor we have some sort of reactor where you're flowing in products from one side you're stirring them together, they're exothermic, they produce heat, and then they flow out the other end. And in a lot of cases, you can get oscillations in uh, the chemical reaction and the temperature, uh, the heat that's output, I should say. And so with an intermediate gas phase especially, if you have another combustion process that's happening after the solid phase, um, you could end up with two competing pathways that switch back and forth, and those could couple into the sound wave. And so I have another video here that shows an example. This isn't a, a combustion reaction, but this is a reaction that oscillates. So let's take a look at that. Okay. So what you'll see 
is the color um, in this reaction actually oscillates back and forth through time. And what's going on is the reaction itself is actually not in equilibrium. Um, so I'm flipping through all, um, <clears throat> through the different states, the intermediate states of the reaction as time progresses. Uh, so that's another possibility of what's happening that would explain why we have a quarter wave solution except for the modal ratio. I should also mention that the combustion instabilities um, that drive pyrotechnic whistles are very so uh, similar to a problem that's in uh, solid rocket boosters. Um, that if you have a, a solid rocket booster, like say on the space shuttle, um, even though that's been retired, uh, you can have these large scale uh, acoustic resonances that are set up that couple into the combustion inside that booster. And if they're not suppressed, if you don't take care of that problem, you end up with basically your, your uh, thrust oscillates with time, and that's a very bad thing. Um, so this is an effect that can occur on multiple scales. But, you know, I hate to end this on a whimper instead of a bang, but the answer is that I don't know. There's a more work to be done in this problem, especially looking at the assumptions of linearity and chemical equilibrium. And so, with that, I'll conclude my talk. A um, couple of acknowledgments. I really want to acknowledge Dr. Greg Swift. He gave a talk at the Physical Acoustic Summer School that I attended a couple years back, um, on, partly on pyrotechnic whistles, and really got me interested in this problem. Uh, Dr. Richard, Richard Raspit here and Dr. Nathan Murray helped me work on this problem. Dr. Murray is my advisor. And I'd also like to thank uh, Jonathan Herlin, who's a physics grad student, for helping me take the measurements. And there's some uh, various papers, books here, for further reading if you're interested. I would highly recommend here the review paper by Davies. Uh, he goes through the whole history of whistles and also has some interesting anecdotes that I didn't include, um, some of them uh, a little more frightening than others. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk. Uh, thanks, and I'll take any questions you'll have. So let's see if I can. Okay. Well, Greg, I had a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. What advice would you give current undergrads that are wanting to go to grad school? Huh. Uh, gosh, well, that's, there's a lot of things I could say. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, if you're looking to go to grad school, um, there's a lot of things to think about, but I think the most important thing is um, identifying a, a school with a department that, that does work that you're interested in. Um, getting to know maybe one or two people there when you're looking at grad schools, that's important. Um, gosh, there's a lot of things I could say. I'm not sure. Do you have anything more specific than that? Uh, uh, I guess more of how did your experience go for heading to grad school? Oh, well, yeah. I definitely went about it in a roundabout way. Um, I, uh, well, I graduated with a degree in physics and math, and I applied to a bunch of physics programs, and I had, I'll be honest, I had the very disappointing experience of being rejected from all the programs I applied to. Um, it was not, was not fun. And uh, I then found that the schools in the South tend to close their applications a little later than others, so I found the aeroacoustics program um, here at Ole Miss and I applied there, and it's worked out, it's, it's really worked out great. I think it, I enjoy working in fluid mechanics and acoustics more than I would have any other topic. But, you know, the, the truth is, is that for me, I kind of just, I landed where I fell. Um, <laughs> and that can happen. Uh, but maybe not the best story for how I ended up in grad school. Um, but it is, it's, it's an important lesson in, when you're an undergrad, you, you think you know what you want from your career and research. Maybe you don't. Maybe you do. I thought I did. 
and um, you're going to get to grad school and you're going to find, you know, wow, this, this is really boring or this other thing is really cool that I had this other research topic that I had never thought about before. And so to that I'd say, you know, when, you, when you're applying to grad school, when you start at grad school, don't, don't uh, back yourself into a corner. You know, be open to trying different research topics um, and, and don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it if you get there and you have to change, change topics or advisors or that sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, it's more important that you end up in a department where you have people that are invested in you and that want to see you succeed. And that more you can learn by when you go to visit schools and, and talking to department chairs and professors. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's my experience and my advice in that aspect. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> but, um, are there any op are REU opportunities at Ole Miss right now? Uh, REU? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, well, we have we have a, a, a BASS program for a summer undergraduate research. Um, I they just put out actually today they put out the announcement for this summer. Uh, the director of the center did. And that's, that's usually, I think, a couple of month program. Um, and there's, there's several PIs here, um, several professors who usually take an undergrad and uh, do some work with them in the summer. Um, it's a good program. Um, uh, it's going to be acoustics related. Um, so, but yeah, the announcement just went out. I would look on, um, gosh, I actually don't know where that would be. Uh, I want to say the NCPA website. But it may not be posted there yet. Um, but if you like, I can I can forward that on to you all there. Um, so you have the information. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. We've had some really really cool work done during the summers in that program. Very interesting stuff. Um, you got any questions? Yeah, I got a question. All right. Um, back on uh, where you showed us the spectral graph with the frequencies. I believe that's what it's called. There was yes. It, it all seemed pretty uniform, except for the blue. There was a really high a peak at one point. Do you know what could have caused that? Peak? Mm. Oh yeah, there was a. Okay, there's like a small peak on the blue line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would estimate that that's just uncertainty. That's uh, associated with <clears throat> the fact that, especially that second harmonic, is far less intense than the first and the fundamental <clears throat> because I have a couple of other trials and that's not repeatable. Um, it's probably just you get to the end of the run, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're in the second harmonic and there's a little uncertainty with where that that peak line is. So, okay. yeah. Any more questions? If you take an instrument like, like a flute or a recorder, it just basically are like a whistle. Could you consider those? Would they be a double open hand, or they, would they just have one open hand? Oh, um, so you're asking if like a so like a, a flute, if it's open open or open closed. Um, I, I actually I should know this, and I don't. I know it depends on the instrument. Um, that some musical instruments are modeled as both ends open and some are one in open and one in close and it's not the ones that you would always think and I'm sure that somebody's gonna give me a hard time for not knowing this after that but uh, I, I honestly don't know very much about musical acoustics but that's that's the non-answer to your question <laughs> I had a comment um, yeah I I'm a biology major, and so I know a lot about chemistry. And I thought it was particularly interesting that you said the whistle mix was made out of aromatic acids. Yes. We're trying to stabilize it, and of course, benzene rings are completely stable, so that's why they added that in there. Yeah, it's. This is actually what I'm working on right now. I'm trying to wrangle a chemist into teaching me organic chemistry so that I can understand this. But yes, I do know that benzene rings are extremely stable. Um, 
So the fact that the only fuels that exhibit this behavior are aromatic compounds that have the benzene ring, um, I don't know. It's, it's definitely a piece of the puzzle, though. Um, and that would be that would be a major breakthrough if, if that could be figured out why those particular fuels do that and something like, say, black powder does not. Um, so, yeah, it's, you're, you're, right, you're right on the mark. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you. All right, let me stop the broadcast.